Welcome back. OK, so in the last few lectures, I have derived the wave equation for a vibrating string, like a guitar string, uh, basically from first principles, F equals MA physics. Um, you get this second order linear partial differential equation. And we talked about how to solve it using uh, separation of variables. So this is the solution here. Uh, I don't really care so much about like the exact details of the solution. The things that matter to me are that we basically decompose u into a function of space times a function of time. Uh, that's called separation of variables, and you get this kind of a form. And so I thought what would be fun today would be to talk about what are the implications of you know, the wave equation and the solution for something fun like slacklining. So I know a lot of you like to slackline. That's essentially where you take uh, you know, two trees and you attach a uh, like a rope or a cable. Usually, it's it's like seatbelt material, some big heavy-duty um, material. You attach a tight line between these, and you basically tightrope walk across it. So there might be some person here. Uh, I'll put myself on one leg, trying not to fall on the slack line. And so I think what I'm going to do in this video, this is going to be pretty short, I hope, is just kind of relate how this uh, relates to the wave equation, how things like the length of the rope, the tension in the rope, the you know mass of the rope or the person on the rope all determine uh, kind of the motion, that kind of thing. And then uh, you know just pose some open problems that you might find interesting to work out as homework problems or just you know to write out little solutions or you know you could also in the comments, uh, please just tell me what you think about, about these questions I'm about to ask you. So we know a few things. We know that we derived this equation based on an argument of infinitesimal deflections where gravity was negligible, at least the mass of the spring. Uh, the, the, the string itself was negligible compared to its tension. And that's certainly true. If you take this human off, and uh, you just pluck this guitar string, this uh, slack line, it'll have a characteristic frequency that will depend on the tension T in the, in the line, the linear density rho, kind of how much it weighs per unit length, that will determine the wave speed of the partial differential equation, and those information, that information in combination with the length, uh, let's say that this length here is L. That tension, the density, and the length L will all go into determining this frequency F, which is kind of the frequency in time that that string will whop, whop, whop um, if there's no human on it, if you just pluck that string and it starts, you know, flopping. And you can kind of picture in your head, I think this is really cool. Humans have an amazing physics simulator capability uh, inside your head. Um, I have a condition where if I close my eyes, I can't actually picture things, objects, but you can still kind of in your mind's eye imagine and hear what the whop, 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 you know, sound would make if you, if you flicked this very large uh, kind of guitar string slack line. So question one is how does this change when I now put a human on it and that human has mass? So this human has you know, mass, m, and gravity is pulling them down at some mg. So now the f equals ma that I used to derive this wave equation is not the mass of the little segment of string, it's the mass of this person pushing down at the string on that point. So now the string is you know, going to be oscillating in the vertical direction, but the force equals mass times acceleration, that tension in the line is not just moving itself, it's moving this person that has a mass m and is being pulled down by gravity with a force g. So I think now what we would have to do is we'd have to modify that uh, f equals ma when we derived this equation. And I'm guessing, again, this is kind of a homework problem for you, I'm guessing we're going to add in a forcing term, you know, plus something like uh, mg, and this is going to be a delta function of x minus 
wherever the person is standing, x minus x naught. Okay, so this is, you know, now I've added some spatial delta function forcing because this person is standing on that, that string. And I think what that's going to mean is that the steady state is no longer flat. The steady state is going to be deflected so that that person is being, you know, kind of pulled up by the tension in that rope, by the y component of the tension in that rope. We're still assuming the small angle approximation because, you know, if you've, if you've ever uh, put one of these slack lines together, you basically use a big ratchet lever system to get this thing super duper tight so that a human can walk on it without it just sagging to the ground. So you still have that small angle approximation, but now the human is putting a massive delta forcing uh, on this thing. Maybe this is a minus uh, mg because it's in the negative direction. Good. Good, good, good. Okay, uh, what else? Okay, so again, revisiting this, if I make the length longer, that should make this, this L is bigger, so this frequency should be lower. So the longer, the just like a guitar string, if I have a longer slack line, the frequency will be lower. It'll be a lower frequency. If I had this thing spanning the Grand Canyon, I'd have a very low frequency. <laughs> Uh, oscillation, which might make it easier, it might make it harder. I'm not sure. I think having too high of a frequency would be difficult, or too low maybe. I think also it's going to interact with the resonance of the human. So this is my other kind of homework question for you, is that if you think of this human as kind of an inverted pendulum, I'm balancing on one foot, I don't think you can see, but if I think of myself as, a, as an unstable inverted pendulum, then we know that an inverted pendulum, or like a grandfather clock, has a frequency, um, or let's say a period of, of oscillation, this human's kind of natural period of rhythm is going to be T, this is not the tension T, this is the period T, this is the T of human oscillation, is going to be proportional to the square root of G over L where L, again, sorry, L is not the length of my slack line, L is the height of the human. Let's call this H, uh, H, the height of the human. So the height of the human, H, and gravity sets up another kind of frequency, uh, which is, you know, whatever um, related, you know, the inverse of this period is the frequency. And so, um, you know, this human, is oscillating. When I'm on a slack line, I am wobbling. And I'm on the line itself, and the line itself is wobbling. And it's wobbling in, in two directions, but we're going to simplify it and say it's one dimensional. And when these time scales, when these frequencies start to get close to each other, that's when you get into really nasty resonances. And so again, uh, because this thing has a sum of sine waves at each of the harmonics of this, uh, dictated by this length L string, I have that low frequency, but then I also get all the higher harmonic frequencies, higher and higher and higher, and at some point, some of those frequencies may interact with kind of the frequency of oscillation of a human kind of, you know, I think of a human as an inverted pendulum, which is kind of like a grandfather clock, which has this basic period, which sets up a basic frequency. And so that's, that's kind of the next question is, okay, well, how do the resonances of the human system and the slack line system interact with each other? What are the frequencies that are being excited? For what length? For what mass person? Uh, and so on and so forth. Because also the mass of the person presumably is adding to the tension of the string. So you ratchet this thing tight, but when that person stands on the string, they are noticeably increasing the tension by their mass. So this T goes up when the person stands on it. That's interesting too. What else? Um, what makes a slack line easier? Okay, so um, my wife's parents put a slack line in at their house. Our kids love playing with it. And so sometimes what you do is you put a little guideline here that basically you can hold on to above your head to kind of guide yourself, you know, so that you don't fall, so that you don't oscillate as much. But for example, if you pull on that so that you take some of your weight up, you're essentially changing the tension in this line 
uh, you know, you're, you're changing the tension because you're taking some of your mass up you're also changing your human period of oscillation because you're changing your effective gravity if you're like if you're taking half of the the force of your body it's kind of like you're you're cutting g in half essentially or cutting m in half all of those things change the dynamics of the slack line so that would be another interesting homework problem is for example imagine i'm putting half of my weight on this guide line how does that change the resonance frequency? How does that change the, you know, the, the dynamics of the slack line? How does that change the dynamics of my oscillation? All of those are kind of interesting problems. For example, what would a slack line look like if I was slack lining on the moon? Would it be easier or harder? Or on Jupiter, would it be easier or harder? Uh, what if I was slack lining on a steel cable versus a big nylon cable, things like that. Those are all the kinds of things. What if I could tension this thing up a hundred times tighter? Would it be easier or harder? Okay, those are all the kinds of questions that I think you can start exploring in this basic setup. I'm not gonna answer any of them, that's my prerogative, <laughs> but I think it's really interesting to think about the wave equation, uh, this really can help you build your intuition, is thinking about things like guitar strings or slack lines or Maxwell's equations. Think about real physics and how that real physics manifests you know, as the terms in these equations. That's why we do math. That's why I do math. Uh, it's not the only reason to do math, but that's why we do applied math, is so that we become facile at modeling the real world, so that we can make assumptions and break assumptions and we know what changes and we know how it changes and we build this kind of intuition uh, for the real world. Anyway, I thought this was kind of a fun one. I've been thinking about this in the back of my mind uh, as I've been preparing this lecture. And so I thought I'd just pose some of these questions to you. Again, uh, curious what you think in the comments. Maybe some of you will solve these or come up with your own problems or maybe we'll get you know, some expert slackliners to give me some intuition because I'm a terrible slackliner about how to make my life easier. All right, thank you.